Prather Stafford with the Girls That Create podcast on Word of Mom Radio. My guests today are China Robinson and Tracy Rector. I previously had the opportunity to interview China and Tracy for the Girls That Create Creator Spotlight series. Their film, No Ordinary Love, sheds a crucial light on domestic violence issues. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, more than 10 million adults experience it annually in the United States. China is an award winning filmmaker whose work includes the historical drama Greenwood 13 Hours, the thriller Lola Lisa, and most recently No Ordinary Love. China also wrote the script for No Ordinary Love, which captures the slow burn destruction of relationships plagued by domestic abuse and how coercive control can be just as damaging as physical attacks. She has been recognized during South by Southwest as a female filmmaker to watch and featured at the American Black Film Festival. Tracy never dreamed of being a filmmaker, but found herself called to be the executive producer of No Ordinary Love. Her passion as a survivor and her desire to reach out to other victims was the force behind the project. As a survivor, her favorite hashtag is start by believing. These words resonate with her experience of being married to a well-known and beloved minister who few believed could be abusive. I am thrilled to welcome China and Tracy to the Girls That Create podcast to talk about No Ordinary Love and why we can't shy away from discussing domestic violence. Hello, China and Tracy. Welcome to the Girls That Create podcast. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. Yes, thank you for having us. Now, I want to start off with, how did y'all meet? How did the idea of this (laughs) come out? I know there's all great, all great projects, there's always a starting point. So what was yours? It's kind of a fun story that we enjoy telling because we get asked that often. Because people will ask me, well, how did you make, what, why did you decide to make this film? You haven't made a film before at this age, you know, this stage of your life. And so, I, but I said, well, I knew a young filmmaker and this is how we met. I bought a hundred year old house and I was fixing it up. Just renovating a little bit to, to rent it out. It was just something that was on my bucket list. I wanted to do that DIY thing. And I had finished it and was, I had leased it, put it on the market on Zillow. And I had just signed the lease like two days before. And my husband and I were driving back from Colorado and I get this phone call. And I usually don't take phone calls. I don't know, but I took this one and China introduced herself and said she wanted to use my 100 year old house to film a movie she was doing. And we talked for a minute. I go, sure, that'd be fine. And then I hang up and my husband goes, what What have you done? You just signed the lease. Are you crazy? Why would you do this? I go, well, I just wanted to help her out. I mean, I don't think it'd be that big a deal. He goes, well, what kind of film is she making? I said, I don't know. I didn't ask her. And he asked, well, what if it's like an adult film or something like that? I go, oh my gosh, I never would have thought of that. So I called her back and asked her. And it was a, an historical period piece on the 1921 Tulsa race riot. So it was a, a wonderful film that needed to be made, a story that needed to be told. Like you mentioned, women's stories need to be told. People stories. So she used my house for the four or five days to film it. Mm-hmm. And I was just really impressed with what she did. She's very thorough in her in all of the research and, and all the details that have to go into filmmaking. So when I decided that I needed to make a film to raise awareness of domestic violence, I reached out to her and asked her if she would partner with me on this. And she jumped at the chance. So that's how we met. <laughs> Fun story. <laughs> Oh, it's, yeah, it's an amazing story. And Tracy, I know you were involved with Safe Haven over in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I want to know if you just want to share a little background about how you became involved with Safe Haven and also what inspired you to want to make this film. That's a really good question. What is the background on all of this, how this got started? So I am a survivor of domestic violence of a 23-year marriage to a minister. After I left the marriage, a few years later, the executive director of an agency in Arlington, Texas, reached out and asked me if I would serve on the board of this agency. And I said, no, I don't really, I'm not ready to do that. Well, she kept asking me every year for like three years. Finally, I said, if you will do something to address spiritual abuse, I'll serve on the board. And she said, okay, that's the deal. So she did. She held a a forum with faith leaders, and we talked about domestic violence intersecting with faith communities and and how the faith leaders could address it more appropriately and the the important role that faith leaders play in, in the survivor's story of that. And so then I served on the board. 
for seven years and two of that was board chair. And so that's how I got to be on Safe Haven. And as I, when I was board chair, I saw and read the fatality review that the agency does every year. It's part of the coordinated community response that a lot of agencies are doing now. It's a program out of Duluth, Minnesota. And the fatality review goes over, it, they, it's a group that meets quarterly and they look at all of the domestic violence homicides through the year and they try to figure out what went wrong. How did we as a community fail this woman? And when we looked at the numbers, they had never shown up at the shelter. They had never called the hotline. They'd never reached out for any kind of services. And that really bothered me. I thought, we're doing all this work and this effort, but we're not reaching the ones that are in the greatest need. How do you deal with that? And so I realized it was a lack of awareness, kind of a twofold lack of awareness. They either don't know all these services are out there for them, free of charge for two years, wrap around to help them leave the abuser and stand firmly on their own two feet, or they're not aware of how dangerous their relationship is. And so when I came up with that answer, then it just proposed another question. Now what do you do with that information, right? How do you raise awareness? I think just a lot of reflection and prayer actually to get to the conclusion that it had to be something big. We're from Texas, so I had to be big. <laughs> but I also wanted it to be a global reach. I, this is a global problem. It's in every single community in every state and country and continent throughout the world. So I really wanted it to be global. And film is a wonderful way to convey a message like that, to raise awareness of a social issue and to make a big impact. So that's why I wanted to make the film, but doing it very boldly, not having any idea how to do that. And so that's where China came in. When she said yes, I go, okay, so I've never done this before. What do we do? And she said, well, we need two things. We need a script and we need money. And I said, okay, you do the script and I'll do the money. I, so I introduced her to the CEO of Safe Haven and she kind of gave her a quick 101 course in domestic violence. Well, I'll let China tell this part. She she can go into that part about how she made the movie. Obviously, you say yes, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm going to tackle this very complex, far-reaching issue. How did you even begin thinking about to conceptualize a script? Like, what were the steps you took to put the story together? Well, first of all, I did not know how complex it was when I agreed. When I said yes, I thought, like a lot of other people, that it was just physical abuse. That was domestic violence. That was intimate partner violence. That was the extent of it. And we could do that. And originally, it was going to be just a short film, like maybe 15 minutes, short film. And so I did connect with the CEO of Safe Haven, and I went into research. I mean, full on, anything that I do, I'm researching. So for about two months, I pulled every stat I could find. I read books. I spoke with the CEO. I went to the shelter. I'm here locally for Safe Haven. And I spoke with women there. I spoke with counselors. I spoke with the hotline workers. Everyone that I could speak to, I sat in on a domestic violence homicide trial with the assistant DA and then a court mandated session with abusers because I also wanted to understand their mentality. Like, are they excusing it? Are they remorseful? Like, what, what is the process there? So from there, I decided, okay, we're going to have these characters. We're going to layer them and build them. And we need more than one type of abuse because I didn't know. So most people probably don't know. And the point is to raise awareness. And so I called Tracy and I said, hey, Tracy, I know we talked about a 15-minute short film, a couple of days of filming, you know, and all of that, but it can't, it has to be a feature so that we can make it really accurate and we can really touch on a lot of different types of abuse and the complexity inside of it. And she said, okay, so <laughs> where do we go from here? And so that's how we got into making this into a feature. Well, I had said from the very beginning, I did not want a documentary. That, that's been done. And I really, if you're going to raise awareness, you wanted to reach people that don't know anything about this or don't know much about this issue. And people that are going to watch a documentary on this are probably already involved in the issue. We wanted it to be far-reaching, to be streaming everywhere so people would watch it and look at it as a romantic thriller and stumble on it. And in the process of watching it, realize, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how complex and how intense that was, how dangerous it was. So when we started the process, I told China I wanted two things. I wanted the film to be authentic, real about what we know about domestic violence now. No burning bed situation where it's only physical violence. 
And the second thing was I wanted her to address spiritual abuse because it's often misunderstood within the domestic violence advocacy groups, but it's also not really known about within the faith communities, and it really it needs to be. So there's a very strong message. But China did some amazing things with the script. The script it obviously won awards, but it it's really interesting how she intermingles the two couples together and how the two women's lives have similarities but differences and so she's addressing i think we have over 20 different issues of domestic violence that we portray in this film some of them a really close-up look focus at it and some of them just a hint at it she's got so many things going on in this movie you almost have to watch it two or three times to catch all of that but i'm really proud of the story that we have uh, it, it's a very powerful story i think that's one thing i really took away from it because it's like a very slow burn but that's how it is and you know, when most films, I think, the ones that have tried to capture it, they just go, boom, straight off the go. And it's like at this very extreme level of abuse. And that's what I really appreciate about the storylines is how, yes, it started off where it's just small things, but small things slowly building upon each other. And then when you put them all together, you see how catastrophic it can be for the person who's suffering. Yeah, well, what we wanted to do was answer the question, why didn't she just leave? Because that was me. Like, I, before I got into the research, sad to say, I was that person, oh, I would never. I, why didn't she just leave? If he's hitting, because again, that was, you know, my full understanding of abuse inside of a relationship. So when I started thinking about how complex and, and all of these layers and everything, I said, well, I have to humanize the abusers. Because if I don't, if they start out as monsters, as soon as we see them, then it's still not answering the question because it's easy. Leave. He's a monster. He's terrible. You know, when I put in, oh, we have date night, though, and it's really nice and he's really sweet and the gift giving and the confusion then that comes and then, you know, everything else, then I think it makes it more believable. We had some people when we did our premiere in the audience, they were rooting for one of the couples to make it. And I said, if you're rooting for it and we're just watching this movie, imagine being inside of that relationship. You just want it to go back to how it was. If only he would stop or she would stop because we know that men and women can be abused. But if only they'd stop doing this. If only we could go back. If, 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 if. And so that's the confusion inside of that type of relationship. You mentioned the physical violent part, and I think it's really important that this film does not start out, like China said, with that part of it. It focuses a lot on that coercive control that every abusive relationship has. Some of them segue into physical, but not all of them do. And it, we do a disservice to victims if we only portray it as physically violent, because a lot of women don't think they're in an abusive relationship. They'll tell you, no, it's not abusive. He lost his job, or it's just only when he drinks, or it's this, but it doesn't have to be physically abusive to be abusive. Course of control is abuse, and it's about power and control. When one person in the relationship thinks or feels like they have the right to have power and control over the other person, that is abusive. So I'm really excited that the movie portrays that and really sends that message loud and clear. Why did you decide to have basically two women, two couples, and kind of follow two narratives versus just one? Because I think that's a unique film tactic to watch the similarities, but also the differences of how the relationships worked. Yeah, well, it was important to have two different couples. Originally, I started out with three because I had the judge that's in the movie. She's married, and um, I was going to make her the abuser. But for the sake of time, I had to condense. And so we do have the two couples. But I thought it was important because had I had just one couple, again, all roads lead back to just physical abuse. And I wanted to show how difficult it is to navigate a relationship that is an abusive relationship, but there is no hitting. Mm -hmm. Because then you have to define it and you have to figure out, you know, is it me? Am I just unhappy? Is it him? Are we just not getting along? Are we just at that point in our relationship where we're just not seeing eye to eye? Like, what is this thing? And so I did want one relationship to focus on something other than the physical. You know, the film really captures the mindset of girls and women being seen as inferior in their home and community, meaning it becomes easier to treat them with disrespect and violence. Why was it important to show common ways that abusers use power and control over victims and that not all abuse is physical? I mean, we kind of touched on that. I think it's like that idea of control. Why was that important to make sure that that kind of comes across? 
because and maybe it's just the idea of not understanding you are being controlled till it, it's yeah. unlike such a high level of intensity. Tracy touched on this just a few minutes ago. Every abusive relationship deals with the power and control element. And so it was very important for me to put that in the forefront in the script. With both couples, it could be financial control, it could be spiritual control, it could be so many different things. He had a tracker on our car, that's control. So there are so many different things that we touched on, but it was important because at the base of it all is power and control. And Tracy, if you wanted to add to that. Well, I was just going to say from a survivor standpoint, speaking from personal experience and also from doing this work for so long, we tend to doubt ourselves a lot. And we question whether we are actually a part of the problem because that's what we're told. That's the narrative that we get from our abuser over and over and over again. If only you would do this or you would stop doing that. And so we're already doubting ourselves. And when there's not that firm confirmation of the physical violence, we continue to wonder if it really is abusive or not. And in the tactics like gaslighting, where they really try to make us doubt that we know what we're talking about. I mean, I even almost shamedly admit that there were points in my relationship where I wish he would just hit me and then I would know that I could leave because you don't have that ticket out the door without that. That's what we think. So it's important to show that to embrace the idea that abuse is that power and control piece. That's what abuse is. And whether that power and control involves physical abuse or not, it doesn't matter. It's still about that power and control. And that's what defines an abusive relationship. There really needs to be a shift away from the culture of blaming the victim. And you think we make progress, steps forward, and then something blows up online and you watch how it's covered, how it's depicted. You could read comments if you really want to be cruel to yourself and get more angry. But you just kind of see that we have so far to go from the victim blaming, blaming the victim instead of the perpetrator, which is infuriating. And I'm just curious what you just to hear your thoughts about how to how people can kind of help try to move that forward and that you know moving away from the victim blaming and how can we be an ally in a sense and that narrative i think the most important part of it is, <laughs> is to start by believing victims that's typically the very how that very victim blaming begins is we don't believe them or Society doesn't believe them for whatever reason. And we've seen several celebrities recently that have been just raked over the coals about that. And it gets down to the fact that the people that oppose her don't believe what she's saying. They think she's lying. So I think there's actually a group that I work with and they have a campaign called hashtag start by believing. And I think it's such an important and strong message to get out to all victims who are suffering through this is that we have an obligation as a society to believe victims. The vast, vast, vast majority are not lying. If they are lying, they're not telling you how severe it actually is. That's where the lie comes in. It's hard to change culture, but we need to change the questions that we're asking. Instead of asking, why doesn't she just leave, which is a very victim-blaming statement, you flip it around and ask the abuser, why are you abusing her? The woman you're supposed to love, the man you're supposed to be loving, the mother of your children possibly. Why are you abusing her? Well, let's let's deal with that first. And that needs to be where the focus is, is on what the abuser is doing. And China, did you have anything you want to add to that? I think she pretty much covered it. I am happy that we're talking about it more on social media. We just have so far to go. But I think like Tracy said, as far as being an ally, it's about believing uh, the victim of abuse and also not just believing because we, we have to believe, but that awareness is a big deal. Like you understanding what it is, which is why we did this movie and the way that we did it is because we want people to say, oh, that's abuse too. Oh man, I saw that or I see these signs or I've been through that. That was me. Because if we're looking at statistics, if it's not you, it's a very close friend or family member, or we're talking globally one in four women and some places one in three. And this is just reported because some people don't know that they're in these types of relationships and some people will never speak up and report it for different reasons, different personal reasons. But I think that's important. It's believing the the victim, not victim blaming, and then understanding what abuse can be and how complex it is. It's not an easy thing to deal with. I wanted to add one more thing about when you talked about the culture around this. 
there are certain communities that we need to really kind of dig deeper into about the culture part. And honestly, one of that is how domestic violence intersects with our faith communities. We look, we're in the South, and so it's a big part of our culture for some of these religious communities, faith communities, and it goes to all religions and all de denominations have some aspect of this. They dictate this imbalance of power within relationships. And they equate that as being based on God's will. But it's this misinterpretation of sacred texts that fit their misogynistic ethos that drives this thinking and tradition. And that's why it's so important for domestic violence advocates to reach out to the faith communities to create relationships with faith leaders so that we can have these conversations, help them understand how they can do more harm than good by giving really bad advice. The marriage can't break up for any reason. You have to stay married no matter what. Well, if he's beating her up or destroying her mentally completely, that's, that's not a marriage. The marriage is already over anyway. So, And it's a tricky balance to be able to get into those communities. But I think it's important to talk about it. And that's one reason why I love the fact that we address the spiritual abuse part in the movie, because it does start important conversations around that. Yes. Also, as someone who's a native Texan, I immediately picked up on that and was, I mean, again, I was like, this is important and should be talked about. And I was sitting there thinking, I've never seen this really addressed. So again, another reason this film very much moved me. Uh, what has been the reaction from audiences um, when you've been on the film festival circuit and also streaming? It's been really good. So we have audiences, we have those who are survivors of abuse. We have those who've worked with survivors of abuse. We have those who had no idea and they just wanted to see a good film, you know, at a festival. And across the board, it's been really, really positive. We've accomplished, I think, what we wanted to do because when a survivor comes up and tells you, I just left my relationship and I was contemplating going back because I missed this and that and, you know, it was comfortable and he said these things and he bought these gifts and, you know, all of that. But then they say, after I watch this movie, I think I'm going to hold out a little longer. Or if we have people say, wow, that I feel so seen. That was me. And people called me crazy because it was like he wasn't hitting you. So what do you mean? You know, it was abusive. So we've had a lot of positive feedback. It's always good for people to watch a film of mine, whatever it is, and say, I really enjoyed that film. And you get accolades and you get these awards and you get this press coverage. But for this particular project, for me, it was the most important to have survivors of domestic abuse come up and say, I feel seen and thank you for doing this. That's huge because I, I would ditto that part of it. We've had domestic violence experts, national leading experts across the country watch the film and tell us that it was authentic, it was powerful, and it does tell the story, why doesn't she just leave? And that was a wonderful accolade for us to get. We won awards at film festivals, all kinds of awards. But the greatest award that we feel like is the survivors that come and say, I saw myself in that story. I saw him in that story. And now I know for sure that it wasn't just me or all in my head. It really was abusive. And I'm going to get help with that. Or I'm not going to go back to him now. Or those kinds of responses. That's what really drives us to continue pushing this film out there to, to get even more awareness. So domestic violence, as we talked about, affects millions of victims each year and has increased in the wake of COVID-19. And a recent CDC report showed teen girls in the U.S. are facing higher levels of violence. Why is it important for parents and caregivers to talk with their teens about domestic and dating violence and sexual consent? Like, why do, should parents be having these conversations with their kiddos? I want to point out that uh, I read that report, mm -hmm. and then I read an article last week in the Washington Post that has called some of that report into question. Uh, evidently that because they talk about a number, I think it was 27 percent increase in this violent episodes that the teen girls were experiencing. And what they did is they took the number from the previous 2019 report and they rounded that number down. Okay. And they took the number from this recent report and they rounded that number up. And to do, if they take unrounded numbers, it's really 18 percent increase, which still the, the sad part to me about that is it takes the focus away from the issue, and now the focus is on the report, and the report wasn't that great, and that right. sort of thing. But we need to keep the focus on the fact that even if it was a 5% increase, we need to not be increasing this. It needs to be going the other direction, and that's that's where the focus needs to be. But to the parent issue, 
This is really important to me because it's a conversation that needs to happen ongoing with parents. You don't wait until they're teenagers to talk about this issue. You don't talk to a seven-year-old about dating violence, but you talk to them about body autonomy. You talk to them about self-worth. You talk to them about bullying, kindness, empathy. Those things are important to talk about when they're younger. And then when they're approaching those teen years, then you segue that conversation into a dating violence situation where you, you talk about what it's like to be in a healthy relationship, the kind of partner you want to be with, someone that, that builds you up and encourages you and is kind to you, not someone that makes you feel terrible about yourself, those kinds of things. So you, it's important to keep that conversation ongoing because it's really hard to have a conversation with a teenager anyway and if you're only starting to have these hard conversations when they turn 13 or 14 good luck with that it's really hard I do a lot of reading about this particular issue and I read something recently that said the best time to talk to your teenager about this issue or any hard issue is late at night because you're tired and you want to go to bed and all of a sudden they want to talk about it. And they said, just don't fall asleep, stay awake and let them talk. And it's better because you're tired, so you're not going to talk so much. You're going to do more listening than talking, which is the way that conversation needs to go. But you can hear where they are in that kind of mentality of that situation or the issue, whatever they're talking about. But I thought that was interesting to, to give that little piece of advice. But it is important to talk about it. And parents need to do their homework. They need to know what are the red flags to watch for for an abusive relationship that their teenager may be in because you're not going to see it. She's going to or he's going to hide it as much as they possibly can from you. So you need to see what the warning signs are. And there are great resources out there for both teenagers and parents to tap into that I can share later if you'd like. Yeah, definitely. We'll put those in the show notes for sure. I would just come in on the on the back end of that. Everything that Tracy said, of course, right now I have a teenage daughter. And so when the film came out, I was so hesitant because I said, I don't know, like she wants to watch it, but there's some parts that are a little bit much. And finally I said, but this is the point. And so I, I let her watch it because then we could talk about, like, that was our introduction to it. Because again, I didn't know too much about domestic violence at all. Any kind of intimate partner violence, I just didn't understand it. So before I made the movie, she wasn't a teenager, you know, or she was right there on the cusp. But I wasn't talking to her about that because she wasn't dating at the time. I didn't know, you know, I just didn't know. And so it's important for people, like Tracy said, to kind of do your homework. And this film provided that for me and I'm still learning and I'm still, you know, finding out more information and, and getting more understanding about it. But I'm able to do that with my teenage daughter and we're talking about it and I'm able to say, hey, what do you see at school? Because now she's in high school, she's a freshman and that's totally different, you know, than eighth grade. But she said, oh, I saw some of that, you know, in middle school. And I said, oh, like what? There's just so much, especially now with technology, because you have that type of abuse that wasn't so much around when we were growing up. It wasn't like we had smartphones and you could, you know, do all of these things and social media. We didn't have all of that. So now that's a big part of it. And so we have to educate ourselves on what's going on online also and familiarize ourselves with these different apps and, and these different chat groups and all of that. So me personally, very involved with what she's doing and we keep that conversation going. And anytime someone comes over and they say, oh, your mom has a film, that, you know, this and that, or my teacher mentioned or my mom mentioned or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we kind of can talk about it. So I can plant a few seeds in a few different homes just by people coming and visiting. So I do think it's extremely important to talk about intimate partner violence and dating violence with teenagers, boys and girls. Absolutely. Which is a great transition over to tell me about Project Ways of Awareness and the project that y'all have been working on there with the film. So I created this program because, and honestly, I don't know if I would have, but for this, but I, we really thought the film was going to be picked up by Netflix. They actually considered it for a couple of months. And then that was when that second wave of COVID came in and we realized that this thing is here to stay for a while. And so they decided the rest of the movies they're going to pick up for the summer were rainbows, unicorns, and horror flicks. Everything fantasy related. Nothing real and uh, depressing, but, which is a shame because domestic violence, as you mentioned, spiked during COVID. And so it would have been a really great time to have it. But because it wasn't going to get, so it's on Amazon Prime and 
uh, lots of other streaming sites now, but it doesn't have the wide-ranging appeal that it would have if it were on Netflix. So I thought, okay, now what am I going to do with this film? How can I do something else with it? Well, when we signed with the distributor, we retained the education license and the DVD license because we thought this might be something we would do. So my biggest goal was to reach the highest risk age group, which is 16 to 24 year olds. So it's hard, hard, hard to get into a high school to talk about this topic, especially in Texas right now. But you can, in college campuses, it is a perfect place to have this conversation. So we created this program and we give the streaming site link, we give them a DVD, and then I wrote a 12-page guidebook on how to have a successful screening that gives them all the AV stuff and all that kind of thing, a little bit of background about the film, and then I took the scenes of the film and broke them down into different categories of abuse. Like we have six scenes that we pull out that are about physical abuse, six with coercive control, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, and then we highlight some of these other myriad of abuses that we have in there. Just so if you're hosting this, you can refer to that book. So that's what the program is. And then we have tried really hard to go to the college campuses and host this. So we were doing really, really great. In the spring of 2021, we had, I think, eight different colleges booked for October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And then in August, the Delta variant showed up. And so all the college campuses shut down for the fall. So no screening of a movie. And then we re we pivoted and all of those got rebooked for February of 2022 for Dating Violence Awareness Month. And then in December, Omicron variant showed up and that shut everything down again. So we're, we're really trying hard. It's, it, COVID knocked us off our feet for a couple of years. But last February, we had one school that they were desperate to do it. We booked it and rebooked it and rebooked it. And she finally said, because I've got grant money. I've got to use it by the end of March. How can we do this? Because I've got to do it virtually. Well, we can't show the movie virtually because we can't protect it. We already had somebody showing it, pirated it. So we have to be very cautious with that. But I said, let's do this. Let's We'll go through, we'll pull out scenes that specifically deal with issues for dating bias, like a lot of the course of control, the, the digital abuse, those kinds of things, and emotional abuse. And we'll do a virtual thing. So what we did, we talked a little bit about the film, we set up the film clip, we showed the film clip, and then we unpack it with them, we talk about it and discuss it. And the students were firing questions through the whole thing. We started and we could see as the students were logging on to get onto the call. And the questions didn't really come after the first film clip, so we went on and we did the second film clip. And then all of a sudden, we just got bombarded with questions. And I think the students were kind of watching, half watching, half listening, and all of a sudden, something that we were talking about brought <laughs> everybody to the screen. We had 950 students on that Zoom call. It went 45 minutes over time because the questions kept coming and coming in and the host kept going, I'm sorry, we're still going. Are y'all okay to stay a little bit longer? We said, absolutely, we'll stay longer. But then the kids had to go to class or some other kind of activity. But we were blown away by the questions and the comments from the college students. They were overwhelmed by what actually is dating violence. The question's like, I had no idea that was abuse. Oh my gosh, they can use an Apple AirTag and do that? They can find out where I am? All Yeah, it's not just for finding your keys. It's lots of other things like that. It can be misused in that regard. So we were really excited about that. But I will, and I'll say something, one more thing, and I'll let China chime in here. The thing that we are probably the most proud about with this project is that eight scenes of our film are shown in a virtual training on course of control for judges in the state of Florida for their family court. I had spoken at a conference last spring and, I, and there was a woman there from the court and she came up to me and she says, we need to talk. And so we, we ended up signing the contract with them and I've seen the training, it's excellent. This is a big issue in family court. The judges don't get it. If it's not physically violent, if you can't show me photographs or ER records or something like that, it's, why is it so bad, that sort of thing. So that, to help them really understand the mental health issue of domestic violence and where all this course of control comes in. And these women are reduced to just almost nothing. They have no resolve left. They have no money left to use it all. They have no ability to take care of themselves. So that uh, we're really proud of that project. That that was a big thing that we did. Anna, you want to add anything to that? Uh, I think you pretty much covered it, and you you ended with the cherry on top. So I'll just let that be. <laughs> How can we educate ourselves about the root causes of domestic violence and stop normalizing the behavior? I would love to hear y'all's thoughts about that. I mean, obviously, 
seeing a film like this is the first step because, again, it's bringing it front and center versus, again, people kind of dismissing it. And I, that was one of the things I really appreciated about the film is how many times it showed people in the community that you're like, oh, this person will offer support, and then they were dismissive of it. I think that is, again, as we've talked about, something so that happens all the time. And especially if you're young, it almost feels demoralizing, like no one will ever believe me, so then I'll just never, I'll just never bring it up or tell anyone, period. I think that's one reason you see then long-term relationships that we've talked about, why don't they leave? Right. I think they also see how other victims, what happens to them when they do speak out, right? How they're vilified and not believed and blamed and ridiculed. And so they, they look at that and go, there's no way I want to step into that mess. So they, and it's the same thing with sexual assault. It's, they don't want to step into that pool. That doesn't look like a lot of fun to do. But I think the one thing that we need to do is it's, if we're really at the stage of this where it's all hands on deck. We must have everybody involved in this. So every agency, community, a government group, anybody that has that intersects with abusers or victims in any way needs to be involved in solving this issue because it, it can't be left up to law enforcement and domestic violence agencies to solve this problem because so many other people have a place in this in this problem solving. And so I mentioned it earlier, this coordinated community response. It's a whole program that a community adopts and they bring the major players to the table. They have two different levels of tables basically, but it really is, it's looking at the systems that your community has, which systems are working, which ones are not, because a lot of them are not working. They work against the victim and for the abuser and not the other way around. But it's also inviting the right people to the table. And I've mentioned this before, but faith leaders need to be a part of this conversation because they are a big part of a victim's journey out of that relationship or her having to stay in the relationship. When, because we, we did in the studies, we know that women of faith who are in an abusive relationship, when they are ready to talk about that, the first person they go to is their faith leader. So we need to have our faith leaders trauma-informed. They need to know what it's like to be a victim, their mentality, the way they talk about things, how they might downplay the violence so much because they're ashamed of that. So it's all this training that needs to happen. We've got to fund this. It's got to have the funding. There's no other way to do it. We have to have money. Like the agencies now, most of them, barely, have enough to shelter the women, to help take care of the children, to counsel them, to give them legal advice. But we don't have enough money to do the prevention programs. We need every classroom in this country needs to have a prevention program from third grade up. We need to talk about the bullying, the harassing, the body autonomy. You don't, no one gets to hug you or kiss you if you don't want them to, you know. And that goes for Aunt Sarah or Grandpa George or whoever it is. You get to have that body autonomy. That's important to talk about. It's unfortunate that these conversations are currently all caught up into politics because there's no, there shouldn't be any politics in this kind of conversation. I think that's where the difference will be when we address this issue properly is to have the appropriate funding in the right places to do the work, to not only do the prevention, but to do the advocacy work, to do the policy changes, to make the, sure that the laws that are on the books are working for us and the ones that are on the books, make sure that we're actually enforcing them so we can accomplish more. One thing I want to touch on too, obviously, Tracy, your experience impacted the film, having China interview you. And then China, I want to touch on the importance of a woman filmmaker telling women's stories, why it's important of the creators of films and books and so on, all the things that we consume, you know, in mainstream media, but why it's important to make sure that women and people of color are having places at the table and sharing these experiences uh, and why that is essential to addressing these really big challenges that we're all facing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think at the base of it all, regardless of whatever you're doing, the world is not made up of one person. You have different experiences, you have different perceptions, you have different ways of telling something. We could have the same storyline, you know, you and I even, and it would be told differently. So because there are some things that I would inject into the story, and I did inject into the story based on my own experience as a woman, as a person of color. And so I think those type of things are important. So in storytelling, filmmaking, book writing, any of these things, it's super important because you can't tell my story, I can't tell yours, you know, in a way. So a man, I think, telling this particular story would have done it completely differently. 
and not saying all men, you know, you can't write for women and women can't write for men or anything like that. But it is important to have that balance in this space. For so long, Hollywood has been one person. And so now we are just starting to push that a little bit to where there are more women, more people of color being able to tell these stories. And you have these amazing stories coming to the forefront because we all have these different life experiences and perceptions and things like that. So I think it's extremely important to have that seat at the table. What can we do in our own communities to help in domestic violence for our listeners? What if, you know, you're listening to this and you're thinking, ah, what can I do? What would be advice that y'all have on like first steps that someone could take? Yeah, my advice would be to, if you if this is an issue you really want to be involved in, which I think everyone should be uh, because of the, the statistics are so high, is to reach out to the agency in your area. And if there isn't one in your area, reach out to a national one and support them financially. We have to have the funding. And there's the government funding gets less and less. There's more and more competition for less and less money. And the private funding is hard to get private funding for domestic violence. It's easier if it's child cancer and things like that where you feel like you're helping children and animals than it is domestic violence. And that's a sad situation because there are many, many children that are affected by domestic violence. But funding is a big piece of it. And then self-educate, be informed. There's so many great national organizations. And you can start with the Domestic Violence Hotline, National Domestic Violence Hotline. They have a website and there's lots of information there and they will send you other places as well. But I think that's the thing is to, to educate yourself, know what to say when someone talks to you about it. So you have the right thing to say, you know what not to say, you, know, you believe them, ask if you can help connect them to resources, help them call the hotline, that sort of thing. It's really important to know that. And then talk about it. Talk about it at your, at your dinner parties or out with your girlfriends. Have conversations about it so that those that are affected by it, feel more comfortable talking about it and sharing their experience. I'm amazed every time I speak publicly, especially if it's to a group of just general public people, like at a fundraiser event or something like that, the number of people that come up to me and tell me their story, it's out there. If you think you don't know someone who is a victim or a survivor of domestic violence, you're not talking about it enough because they are out there, possibly even in your own family, your neighbors, and your close friends. You just need to talk about it. I would echo the same thing. It's funny because what I realize is that a lot of people in these different situations, if they're questioning or if they know that something is not right, that it's a step past just a toxic relationship, you know, because that's the word right now. Toxic relationship is toxic. But there's a difference between a bad relationship and an abusive relationship. And a lot of people kind of tiptoe, you know, they, they, or they put their toe in the water to try to tell you kind of what's going on. So like Tracy said, if you educate yourself and you are at least a little bit aware, you know, of the resources that your community offers or even the national hotline, you can say, hey, you know, that sounds like this. And maybe it's not, but maybe it is. And maybe you can help your friend or your coworker or your family member or whomever it is that's speaking with you about it because they're wanting help. They're wanting someone to say, yeah, I think you're right. I think that does sound a little off because a lot of people don't know, which is why, again, it circles back to why we did the movie because a lot of people don't know, including myself. If I were to have a conversation before I did any research for this film and someone said, hey, you know, someone is putting a tracker on my car, you know, my, or my, my husband, boyfriend, whatever, or he's, you know, in my emails or social media accounts or whatever it is, you know, or, you know, he kind of grabbed me the other day. It's the first time he's never done it before. And he was, you know, kind of on edge, but he kind of grabbed me and I didn't like it. Or he used this, like there are little bitty things that may have stuck out to them in a way that they know is, unhealthy um, and unsafe even. And so if someone comes to you with just a little information, encourage the conversation if you're comfortable and if not, have the resources at hand so that you can help that person. This might be of interest, but when we were filming, a lot of the cast and crew didn't really know what the story is about. So the, the cast, they know what their part is, they know what their scenes are, but they're not really sure what all the rest of it's about. And the crew were just, you know, they're showing up through lights and cameras and all that kind of stuff. And so we're, it's about day three of filming, and it's become obvious this film has a message. When you're between scenes and they're resetting up all the equipment or you're just having a lunch break, the conversation got to be around domestic violence. And 
all the ones, all the people were sharing their personal experience or a friend or family member of theirs. And almost everybody had a story to share. And it was, it kind of blew me away. I was not expecting that. But I mean, we even got to the point where China would say before we start filming, okay, this seems intense. If anybody just needs to take a break and step out, you know, the, from the, the crew or whoever didn't need to be essential holding the boom or whatever, if you need to take a break and step out and do that and then come back and join us. We had to be cognizant of the fact that some of these people have had these experiences and they may not have ever been triggered like this before. And this film can be very triggering. So that was kind of a good lesson for us to learn that we do need to be cautious when we talk about this. Absolutely. Well, Tracy and China, thank you so much for coming on the Girls to Create podcast. No Ordinary Love, where can you find it? Online? Which uh, streaming services? It's on okay. Amazon Prime, Apple TV, what are the others? Google Play, iTunes. If you go to our website, noordinarylovemovie.com, there are some direct links on there. There are some places to see it that aren't there. I've heard recently, I've learned about Crackle. I had no idea what Crackle was, but it's evidently a site where you watch a movie and you don't have to pay for it because there are ads in the middle of the movie, just like you were watching it on TV. And so some people, that's where they like to watch the movies. We've shown it a ton of times on that one. But there are lots of different places. Just You can just Google it or uh, just search on the, the place that you like to watch movies and see if you can find it there. Quick, quick follow-up question to that. Are you all going to be doing the community visitation and screenings? Is that still going on? Or is that the plan? Yeah. So yeah. We're constantly working on that. I When I, I spoke at the conference last spring, I made a lot of connections, and I've, we've been able to do several of them. We deeply discount the movie program, Project Raise Awareness, for domestic violence agencies. They don't have the funding that the colleges, universities, the community groups have, and so, and they don't need us to be there to host it. They, they have all the expertise to do the Q&A afterwards. So we really... I encourage domestic violence agencies to use it and screen it to their donors, their constituents, their community leaders, their all of their attorney general's office and judges and lawyers and anyone that's interested in learning more about this. We encourage them to use it for that purpose. If they're interested in bringing y'all to their communities, definitely will. Thank y'all. That was really great. Thank you so much for having us both. Yeah, we're excited to speak to you again about our film. To all of you tuning in, thank you for joining us on Girls That Create on Word of Mom Radio. If you would like to screen No Ordinary Love in your community, see our show notes for a link to schedule. We are going to close out with our theme song from Smith Sisters and the Sunday Drivers. Till next time, this is Erin Prather Stafford. If you think you or someone you love needs help because of an abusive relationship, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Sure.